Hello, BookTube. Well, it's a bleak and barren Sunday here at Hyde Cottage. Uh, and for those of you who might be new to the channel, that is my whining, complaining term for Sundays when I get no free books in the mail. And if you were watching my videos this week and seeing the ramparts climbing towards the ceiling, you might think, well, isn't it a good thing that you're not getting too many free books in the mail? Isn't it a good thing you have a day off? Weren't you complaining about how many books you were getting in the mail? Uh, and I was. But you see, what you fail to understand if you ask that question is the Zen Sunni master level of complaining to which certain people of Irish Catholic descent can raise the whole prospect of whining. <laughs> you raise it to the Zen Sunni level where you can complain on either side of the exact same thing at the exact same time. So as an old friend of mine once put it, there's absolutely no winning. <laughs> Uh, but in addition to being a bleak and barren Sunday, this is also day four of March Mystery Madness, a big booktube uh, event that was organized by Elizabeth and Lizzie Fay Loves Books uh, that's designed to celebrate murder mysteries. And she has recruited 20 hosts to help move the event through the month. And... Uh, she invited me to be one of them. Very first time anyone's ever invited me to host an event on BookTube or help to. Uh, and uh, I've jumped into it because I, of course, love murder mysteries. I've hardly ever met anyone in my life who didn't love murder mysteries. Uh, so we're just making videos throughout the month and, and talking about murder mysteries and encouraging everyone to get involved. Read, read, pull some of those murder mysteries off your TBR or off your shelf and read them. Uh, and to, uh, to celebrate the occasion, Elizabeth... Uh, did an updated version of her March Mystery Madness book tag and tagged all of her hosts. So, so I was tagged. Uh, and it's, it's six prompts based around the words March, Mystery, and Madness. <laughs> and the first one uh, is the first of the two about March are uh, pick a book that has green on the cover or the word green in the title uh, because... You know, March is the beginning of spring in America, in, the, in the, this hemisphere. And allegedly, it doesn't feel it today. <laughs> and Boston is, is looking more and more like it's going to get a sleety blizzard in the middle of next week. So <laughs> spring feels a long way off, even though my lilacs are budding. Uh, but also because March is St. Patrick's Day and, and all things Irish and whatnot. Uh, so, uh, but when I was thinking about this, the very first book that came to mind is the one I'm choosing here. But the more I thought about it, and the more I linked it with a couple of other books in this tag, the more I realized that in addition to being a spotlight thrown on an author or a book, there are also uh, inadvertent illustrations of how things get dated. And I think that's interesting in its own right. Uh, and the book that I chose was a 1979 novel by John MacDonald called The Green Ripper, which stars his He-Man, two-fisted, open-shirted, uh, main character, Travis McGee, who has a, a boat that he's named and that he won in a poker match and that he really loves. And he, he is, he's a, a action hero and a womanizer and lives a kind of Jimmy Buffett life before Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> uh, and McDonald wrote a long series of books starring Travis McGee because they were very popular and, and still have their devotees today, although I think the Travis McGee novels are all out of print. Uh, and... In the, there are always women, beautiful women, in the Travis McGee novels. They come and go. They're always in his bed. And it's very uh, sexual revolution kind of thing. There's, there's uh, an interchangeable element about it. And in The Green Ripper, Travis McGee makes a connection with a woman, one of, the one of these beautiful women, that is slightly deeper than the absolute lack of connection that he's made with all the other women who came before her and all the other women who are going to come after her. And when she is murdered, he's therefore more personally involved in the crime than he usually is. Uh, and I read the book when it first came out, and then I just recently reread it. I found it at a used bookstore, and I reread it. And uh, the uh, offhand, oily sexism of the thing really struck me in 2018 in a way that it did not strike me in 1979. <laughs> uh, the, the reaction that Travis McGee has to the many women who fill these books is the reaction of a man towards another and lesser species. They are definitely on the spectrum in which he works things out and 
has clipped conversations and loves his boat. On that spectrum, they certainly are not human. Uh, and it's it's actually that that sexism, that offhand sexism, is underscored when suddenly one of these less than human creatures uh, reaches him on some slightly deeper level. That that just makes the whole thing more painfully obvious. I hadn't realized that when I first read the book. Uh, so this. Is, it's a really good example, and it's going to come up a couple of times more in this tag, of the way in which a book can get dated. Uh, so that I, I can't imagine... Well, in, in, the 19, in, the early, in the 1970s and the early 1980s, I don't think Travis McGee, the Travis McGee novels had any female readers. <laughs> Certainly as a bookseller, I never sold one to a woman, unless it was explicitly for a man. But now... In 2018, I find it hard to believe that all but the most unreconstructed rhesus monkey of a man would read these things and not notice that. <laughs> that that they are clearly written for men in a tenor that says that women are not just not men, but alien beings, space beings put down on Earth to be worshipped and protected, but certainly never talked to. <laughs> not I, it, was, it was very strange. So I'm in the odd position here with the Green Ripper of using it as the answer to a prompt without explicitly recommending it, <laughs> which is kind of strange on this channel. I usually do a lot of recommending. If you were in the mood to read an action-oriented, even man-oriented uh, series of mystery-slash-thriller-slash-action-adventure novels, it would be a while uh, working down the list before I got to John McDonald. So, so uh, uh, let's move on to the second one. The second one is also a prompt for March, and that is a book with Irish elements or that features a leprechaun or other tiny character. Now, of course, thinking back to the Decalogue that we dealt with on the, my first day of March Mystery Madness, leprechauns are ruled out. Supernatural elements are ruled out as a matter of course in a murder mystery, according to that Decalogue, and for understandable reasons. If you have a supernatural character, then the rules of law of cause and effect and whatnot are suspended. And if they're suspended once, you don't know where else they'll be suspended. There's no way to solve the crime. You just wait around to be told the solution, which is not very satisfying. Uh, uh, but in this case, I picked an, a, a book with an Irish element. There's a, a harmless, fluffy murder mystery series by Carlene O'Connor, set in uh, a town called Kilbane in County Cork and starring a big, contentious family called the O'Sullivans that get involved in one kind of a mystery after another. And the books are, they're light little souffles of things. They're not, uh, they're not really meaning to give you a taste of Ireland. Instead, they're meaning to give you a taste of the idea of Ireland in the mind of, <laughs> in, the, in the common hallmark card parlance of Ireland. So they're, travel brochures, basically. <laughs> They're extremely meaty travel brochures. Uh, but then we'll move on. We'll move on to the two prompts that center around the word mystery. Uh, and uh, the first one of those is recommend a mystery that you love, plain and simple. And I, I thought recently, because I, I read a lot of new releases, and I thought about The Woman in the Water by Charles Finch, which is the latest in his uh, Victorian era mur murder mystery series, Starring uh, as a protagonist, Charles Lennox, who is the younger brother to a lord and uh, wants to be a detective, is a detective in the whole series that when we meet him. But this, The Woman in the Water, is a throwback. It's a flashback novel to his very first year as a consulting detective. Uh, so we see all sorts of, we see, first of all, Lennox as a, a young, callow man, and we see all of his supporting characters either not there, or he's just meeting them, or he's in the early parts of his relationship with them. And it's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And because it takes place in the past, because it's, you know, it's, it's his first murder mystery, and presumably fans of the series have read all the other books. I mean, it's a great jumping on point, if you need one. And you should, because this is a series well worth reading. But I have to figure that the author is thinking that this is a, a treat for my readers, for my longtime readers, not just a jumping on point. Uh, and it, as a result of that, of it being unmoored in time, uh, the author is freer to be funny, even though there's a murder. He, he, there, there, there's a, a greater lightness to it, because on, on one level you know that nothing's at stake. You know the main character isn't going to die. And you know... If you've read the series, you also know which other characters are not going to die. <laughs> uh, so I highly recommend it. It's it's uh, 
it's not as light as the Carlene O'Connor books, but it is still light. It's a, it's a light historical murder mystery that you will love. Uh, and then mystery number two, the prompt, prompt number two for mystery, is a mystery that you are greatly anticipating. Uh, and for me, that, well, there are many, there are many, 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 but when I say greatly anticipating, I mean that I haven't yet received an advanced copy of it, uh, and I'm getting advanced copies now to the end of the summer, so, uh, and the one I have in mind uh, is Incorruptible by Barbara Nadell, uh, which is, she has an, an inspector, uh, Inspector Ickman, uh, who, who lives and operates in modern-day Istanbul, and they're really good. They're sharp, they're smart, they're dark, uh, and Istanbul is evoked magnificently. The modern Istanbul is invoked magnificently. And this is, uh, Incorruptible is late in the series. I, I want to say the late teens, 17, 18, maybe 19, maybe even 20. Uh, so there have been many books. And yet, the Ickman series has flown below the radar, and that bothers me. I, this is really, really good stuff that not a lot of mystery writers or mystery readers uh, know about. So I want <laughs> I'm very much looking forward to Incorruptible, and I think that the rest of you should, if you don't know the series, go and find the first one, you know, for five cents online or at your library. And, uh, although, now that I think about it, uh, this is one of those series where every book is kind of a, a contained compartment. You don't really need to go all the way back to the first one unless you're a, of a completist mind frame. You could just read whatever uh, whatever Barbara Nadell book your library has. It would work just as well. Uh, and then we move on to uh, the madness prompts for March Mystery Madness, and we come back again to the idea of dated. Uh, and the first one is pick a book featuring a psychopath. And of course, like a lot of you, the first thing that came to mind was Silence of the Lambs by Thomas Harris, which is a terrific novel. I, I recommend it all the time, and I especially recommend it to people who think they don't need to read it because they've seen uh, one or both of the movie adaptations. I, I, <laughs> it's those, people, the, those are the ones that I almost more want to read the book because now that you know every detail of the plot, you can concentrate on the writing. Thomas Harris is a wonderful writer, and you might not get as much of that as you should if you're also concentrating on what's happening in the plot, because the plot's very twisty and turning. And if you've, if you've seen the great movie or the only good movie of Silence of the Lambs, then you don't have to worry so much about the plot. Uh, the, I, so often I find myself in the position of, of, with people of saying, okay, you say I'm not going to read Silence of the Lambs because I saw the movie, you might want to. <laughs> uh, and I recommend the book mainly because of that, because it's it's so smart. It's so beautifully written. However, <laughs> uh, it has the potential to be dated. Now, we look at, we look at Travis McGee. We're in 2018. It was written in, to, in 1979 and is loaded with casual, un unthinking sexism. The idea that one of the beautiful women who who go in and out of Travis McGee's bed could ever strap on a sidearm and help him to solve a crime is unthinkable in the world of Travis McGee. It would never happen. Uh, and by the same token, that, that those 40 years, 50 years, looking back, reveal the datedness of some of the Travis McGee stuff, by the same token, I believe that you can look forward 50 years or 60 years. Let's, let's look to the end of the 21st century. We're in 2018 now. Let's look to the end, provided we, that, that the world doesn't end in nuclear fire. Look to the end of 2018. Let's say, let's say 2088. In, in 2088, a lot of you will be alive then. In, in 2088, if things continue the way they are, if there's no new Dark Ages, I could easily foresee that this prompt, pick a book featuring a psychopath, that readers at that time would think that was just as dated as what I encountered in The Green Ripper. They would say, well, featuring a psychopath, well, you're, what? So you're going you're gonna, 
chortle and and have a good scare because the psychopath is killing people. But psychopathology is totally involuntary. It's a, it's a chemical imbalance, maybe paired with traumatic childhood experiences, but either way, totally outside of the person's control. So having them as the ooh, boogeyman, scary villain in a murder mystery is like the 19th century having an albino as the scary boogeyman in a murder mystery. I could easily see a reader in, in 2088 thinking, Boy, yeah, in the, in the early 20th century, they had psychopaths as, as villains in books instead of medical patients. I, and yeah, I could easily picture a version of me in 2088, or me, <laughs> saying, boy, that really dates. Yeah, we're, we're meant to think of these people as monsters when they're victims. Uh, give me instead a murder mystery. There are plenty of them, and there will continue to be plenty of them. Give me instead a murder mystery in which the villain isn't a psychopath. It's just deciding on what they want to do. Deciding, for instance, that there's nothing they won't do for money. Deciding, for instance, in, in cold, normal brain chemistry logic that that they hate someone so much that person has to die, as opposed to... Uh, in the Silence of the Lambs, where we have, uh, you know, the Tooth Fairy, or in Red Dragon, we have Francis Dollarhide. In in Silence of the Lambs, we have, you know, it puts the lotion in the basket or it gets the hose. Uh, the main character in in Silence of the Lambs is is obviously round the bend. There's obviously something seriously wrong with his brain conditioning, with his brain chemistry, that's making him do horrible things. I could easily envision a time not too far off when readers will look back on that and say, oh, well, okay, it might be beautifully written, but I can't really recommend it. <laughs> and if that's true for the first March prompt that I have, it's even more true for the second March prompt that I have, I'd like to believe. Second March prompt is pick a book that features a sporting event or recreational activity. And because I've been reading murder mysteries forever, when I hear murder mystery and sporting event, the very first name that comes to mind is Dick Francis, who wrote, Oh, dozens of murder mysteries set around racetracks, horse racing, and whose son, I believe it is, continues to write murder mysteries set around racetracks. And they, the Dick Francis novels sold by the bucket loads, got the, the mother of all uh, endorsements when it became known, and not contradicted by the palace, that they were Queen Elizabeth II's favorite books. And yet, <laughs> I can easily foresee a time. I would hope it won't take as long as 2088. I would hope that it will be much sooner than that. In fact, it's already here in a lot of quarters. Where the idea that this would happen, that you would set a murder mystery around horse racing, is unthinkably barbaric and cannot help but ruin the reading experience. <laughs> that... I, can't, I can easily envision a way in which all of Dick Francis's books would become incredibly dated on exactly that ground. That readers from 2058 or 2068 would say, oh, well, okay, here, here's a bunch of novels from back when animal racing was still legal anywhere in the world and drew huge crowds to watch these, these helpless animals get whipped and beaten around a course for you know, for the betting pleasure of the, the human audience, even if they coughed up blood, collapsed, cracked their legs, had to be shot in the head, all that sort of thing, even if they were doped up with drugs to the gills. The, it, I could easily picture a reader in 2058 saying, boy, you know, these books might be entertaining on one level, but boy, aren't we all glad that we're, we've outgrown that. <laughs> <laughs> so these are, I think these are interesting ways to look at, you, you pick the very first books that come to mind, big marquee title names, and realize that you can easily foresee that they won't stay that way. And that explains the gigantic auditoriums full of mystery novel authors who had their day and are now gone. Now, some of them are gone because the publishing industry is neglectful of its own, but a lot of them are gone because they're dated, very dated. Because, because if you have a, a rural New England murder mystery that's all everyone's all on tenterhooks, and it turns out at the end that the bad guy is just a ventriloquist, you're going to read that and think, ah, oh, okay, so that wasn't dime a dozen back then. That was unusual, and somebody built a story around it. 
<laughs> but you're not going to, it's not going to work on you <laughs> at all. It's going to be prohibitively dated. <laughs> so anyway, that wraps up the, uh, the murder mystery book tag. The March Mystery Madness book tag. And all that's left for me to do is tag people. I have a small list of people I want to tag in case they're interested. Although, if you're, you know, it's the same old booktube thing. If you're watching this and you like the idea, feel free uh, to do this. And also, feel free, I should say, to participate in March Mystery Madness. Make, even if you don't plan on reading a murder mystery this month, you can still participate. Just turn on the camera and make a video about your own experience with reading murder mysteries. It doesn't have to be one you're reading now. Just pick what what murder mysteries have you read and liked or want to read and like anything like that uh, all by all means participate uh, but i want to tag um dave at wild reads i don't know i don't know what what his how he varies from his uh from his own video schedule but i'd love to hear his answers to these questions uh matt at mcs books uh sean at sean the book maniac i would love to hear his answers Roz at journey through books uh, and Maeve at Scribble Maven, if she if she reads murder mysteries and wants to talk about them, that would be great. And I will try to remember to leave links down below to all of these people, because if you, of course, I tag them, but in addition, if you don't subscribe to their channels, you really should, because you're you're missing a wide variety of really good stuff. Uh, but there you go. That is the uh, the March Mystery Madness book tag, <laughs> and it has it has brightened up a. A bit, a, a gray and gloomy Sunday without any mail. <laughs> I'm going to get back to that Sunday now and get back to work. But I will see you soon. Thank you, book two.